Well, everybody, Professor Barth here, Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. Welcome to Foundations of Western Political Thought. This is part two of our section on Thomas Hobbes, the famous English philosopher and political thinker. If you haven't seen part one, you're going to want to do so. I give an overview of Hobbes' thesis in Leviathan. Here, of course, is the famous front piece to that work, published in 1651. But before we dive deep into the text, I'm going to do a little history. Now, you can analyze and evaluate the text alone in isolation, word for word, and try to make sense of, of the arguments. But it's incredibly helpful, and as a historian, I would argue integral, to first examine the historical context in which it was written. And in the case of Leviathan, I mean, you look at this life, Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1670, 1679, 91 years, an extraordinary lifespan in the early modern period. England, through much of his life, most of his life, was absolutely engulfed in political tumult, in political instability. And the source of much of that instability was the seemingly perpetual conflict between king and parliament. It's going to have a major impact on Hobbes's worldview. And so in this video, we're going to take a look at early Stuart England. We'll st stop in around 1640, look at divine right of kings, cover the basics, just general overview, won't be exhaustive or by any stretch. And then for part three, we'll pick up in 1640 and examine the English Civil War, the interregnum in the 1650s. There's the decapitation of King Charles I in January of 1649. Two years after this beheading of, of Charles I, Hobbes publishes Leviathan, right in the middle of all this. All right, so we're going to, do, we're going to have two history lessons back to back. Thomas Hobbes, born in 1588, in the midst of the famous Spanish Armada invasion, attempted invasion, the Armada is defeated in 1588 by the English. It's one of the greatest victories in English military history. Absolutely humiliating for Spain, devastating for Spain, but massive victory for England and Queen Elizabeth. Hobbes is born toward the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, 1558 to 1603, a very, very popular queen. And in the first part of his life, he'll live under First Elizabeth, then James I, and then Charles I. We'll examine James and Charles a little more closely in this video today. Now it's important to note that the English monarchy during this period, the Tudor-Stuart period, uh, was quite powerful, far more powerful than the English monarchy would be afterward. However, by continental standards, uh, the English monarchy was quite restricted in what it could do. Local administration, for example, was not governed by the crown. It was administered by local officials. The judiciary depended on the common law tradition. Common law relied on judicial precedent, on the recognition of certain fundamental rights, such as property rights. Property rights were highly regarded by the English courts during this period, and that countered sort of the, the discretionary, arbitrary whims of the monarch in the, in the courtroom. So that was another restriction. But also, of course, the English monarch had to share power with the aristocracy and with the gentry who convened independently in a body called parliament. And this was a restriction that was quite unique to the English experience. And probably the greatest constraint of all was the, was the matter of money. The English monarchy, if they wanted to raise new revenue, had to work and had to cooperate with the parliament. And so this was quite a restraint on the power of the monarchy. Now, parliament dated back centuries prior. All, dang, all the way back to 1066 when William the Conqueror 
invaded England from Normandy, in order to secure his rule, he sought the uh, approval and cooperation of the local nobility and clergy. And so he allowed them to convene and counsel and would consult them on various actions. Well, this so-called Great Council, beginning in the late 11th century, the name of it eventually morphed into Parliament. And that word Parliament comes from the Latin and the French. The French verb parler means to speak. And so this was a forum where at first the nobility and the clergy could discuss legislation and uh, various matters of state. So you have Parliament. You also have Magna Carta. In the early 13th century, in 1215, a group of rebel barons compelled King John to agree to this, what became a constitutional document, limiting the power of the monarch, acknowledging the right of habeas corpus. The king could not simply imprison you without trial or without cause. Uh, you must receive swift justice. This is all part of due process of law. It has its origination here in Magna Carta, and the, the English translation of Magna Carta is the Great Charter. Another limitation on the power of the monarchy dating to Magna Carta was the need to consult Parliament if the king wanted to raise revenue. In short, Magna Carta is remembered for protecting individual rights against the arbitrary whims of a despotic authority. And the kings that followed respected this custom and when they wanted to raise revenue, additional revenue, such as dur during a time of war, they would consult parliament and parliament would grant those taxes. Now, through much of most of the high middle ages and into the early modern period, Parliament cooperated with the crown. That was the ordinary expected mode of affairs. There wasn't much tension between Parliament and King at this time. By the late 14th century, Parliament had evolved into two chambers, the House of Lords, and the House of Lords represented the aristocracy, the clergy, but then importantly, the House of Commons, which represented the interests of the merchants professionals like doctors and lawyers. Two-chamber parliament, they adopted those names, House of Lords and House of Commons, during the 16th century. Now, <clears throat> after the War of the Roses, which was a dynastic war between two competing houses of the Plantagenet family, the Tudor family emerged victorious, and in 1485 to 1603, the Tudor house governed England. The most famous Tudor monarch was Henry VIII. And of course, Henry VIII's reign was one of great instability and turmoil, especially matters of religion. In 1534, Henry broke from Rome and declared himself the supreme head on earth of the Church of England. Very controversial monarch, very powerful monarch. Parliament, for the most part, cooperated with Henry. Then when Henry died in 1547, his only son became king, Edward VI, but he died six years later. He was a fairly weak king. And then Edward's older sister, Mary, who was the daughter of Henry VIII and the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, who was whom Henry had divorced, kicked off the whole uh, controversy with Rome. Mary became queen. She was a devout Catholic, tried to impose Catholicism on, on England, burned close to 300 Protestants at the stake. She died five years later at age 42, no children. And then she was succeeded by her half-sister, also daughter of Henry VIII, but daughter of Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth became queen in 1558. And for a good three, three decades or so, England enjoyed some relief, some political stability. Finally, Elizabeth was a popular monarch. During her reign, English commerce uh, spread out into the Mediterranean, into the Baltic. Joint stock companies were formed. Merchants became very wealthy, and many of those merchants entered the House of Commons.
shipbuilding, exploration overseas across the Atlantic. Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe for England in 1577. The first attempted colonization in North America by England happened during Elizabeth's reign. Didn't succeed, but nonetheless a momentous event. English ships began venturing into the Indian Ocean. This was the age of Shakespeare. Lots of art, literature, theater, building projects. Population of London grew to approximately 200,000 by the end of Elizabeth's reign. Spanish Armada defeated in 1588. Now, for most of her reign, Elizabeth cooperated pretty well with Parliament. Again, she was a popular monarch. She called Parliament when she needed money. Sometimes it might go three years without a Parliament in session. But Parliament cooperated when she needed them. However, by the 1590s, toward the end of Elizabeth's reign, and some troubles began to appear. Um, a major plague broke out in London in the early 1590s. There were a series of bad harvests in the 1590s that contributed to a lot of uh, poverty in England, especially in the slums of London, which had become quite overcrowded. A years-long rebellion uh, erupted in Ireland toward the end of her reign. Parliament never uh, broke out into open conflict with Elizabeth, but the House of Commons especially was becoming more assertive and a little more restless. By the end of Elizabeth's reign in 1603, there were 462 members of the House of Commons. So this is a large body. Elizabeth dies in 1603 childless. She was the Virgin Queen and she was the final monarch of the Tudor dynasty. Replacing her was King James. Now James had been King of Scotland since 1567, where he was known as James VI. And when he becomes King of England, he will be James I. James was the, uh, James's great grandmother was the older sister of Henry VIII. And so that made him next in line for the throne. This also combined the crowns of England and Scotland, and so you get the uh, Union Jack. Ireland isn't yet included in the flag, but um, you see the combination of the Scottish and English flags there in 1603. Now, Thomas Hobbes, through this period, the 1590s and early 1600s, uh, entered private schooling, where he studied Latin and Greek this will help him when he attends the University of Oxford early in James's reign. More on that in a moment. But King James, perhaps best known for the authorized version of the Holy Bible, which came out in 1611, the King James Version, KJV Bible. He's also known, of course, for Jamestown, the first permanent English settlement in America, 1607. But James is also known for his embrace of the doctrine of the divine right of kings. This is a, an excerpt from a speech that James delivered to Parliament in 1610. Now, remember what I said about the House of Commons. The House of Commons, by this point, com consists of men who are they're not nobility, they're, they're, they're commoners, but they're wealthy, they're ambitious, they're well-educated, many of them attended university, and they want a share in government. Okay? They're not against the monarchy, they are enthusiastic supporters of the institution of monarchy. There's no anti-monarchalism going on here in the commons during this period, but they want a share in governance. James says this to them in 1610. The state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth. <laughs> wow! The supremest thing upon earth. A lot of supreme things on earth. Well, according to James, the institution of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth. For kings are 
God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne. In the scriptures, kings are called gods. And so their power after a certain relation compared to the divine power. Now, what's he talking about there in the Bible it calls kings gods? Well, in I believe it's Psalm 82, the psalmist quotes the Lord as saying, as referring to earthly kings as lowercase gods. Now, the psalmist here does not mean that the kings were di literally divine. What he's signifying here is that the kings are very powerful. But J James sees this, kings are called gods, lowercase gods in the scriptures. They're compared to the divine power. Kings are also compared to fathers of families. They are the true parent of the country. Six years later, in a speech to the Star Chamber, which was a secret prerogative court, more on that in a moment, James said this, that which concerns the mystery of the king's power is not lawful to be disputed. You're not to dispute or even debate the extent of the king's power, for that is to wade into the weakness of princes and to take away the mystical reverence that belongs unto them that sit in the throne of God. Kings sit in the throne of God, and so they merit mystical reverence from their subjects. James, in short, has a very, very high, extraordinary, extraordinarily high view of the institution of monarchy. Well, back in 1598, when he was simply king of Scotland, he was not yet king of England, he'll become king of England in five years. But as James the six, he published a short treatise called The True Law of Free Monarchies. And in this treatise, he, he outlines his, um, his idea of divine right of kings. Now, <clears throat> James was not the first to embrace divine right of kings, okay? But he is an ardent defender. And actually, in preparing for his lecture, I, I read through this. It's fairly short. You can find it for free online. But in it, he calls... Monarch, the institution of monarchy, quote, the true pattern of divinity. The person and authority of the king are sacred. And so it's sacrilegious to challenge it. The king functions as a natural father to his subjects. And like a father, the king has some obligations. The king is obligated, divinely obligated, to protect his subjects by encouraging righteous deeds, by chastising the wicked, by punishing the wicked. The king has that obligation and must abide by it. However, subjects also have divinely ordained obligations and they are divinely obligated to obey the king, to submit to the king unconditionally, unconditionally. They are not to rebel against the king. Even They are not to rebel even against a wicked king. Now, now James had made it clear that kings are not to be wicked. Kings are actually to be, they are to be righteous. But the judge of the king is, should not be the people. It must not be the people. The king shall, quote, be judged only by God. Only by God. Now, a wicked king's going to face have a hard time on Judgment Day. James explains, um, kings are held to a very, very high standard. To quote Christ in the Gospel of Luke, "To whom much was given, much will be required." So, so a, a wicked king is going to is going to have hell to pay on that great and awful day of judgment. But subjects or earthly institutions are not to do that work. They are not to be the judge. Only God is the judge. If the king is wicked, subjects still must submit to those commands of the king that are good, to righteous commands. But what if a king commands something wicked? What if, uh, for example, the king commands you as a private subject, or as a subject, 
to bow down to an idol or something of that nature. Must you submit? Must you obey? No. Uh, James says, if you are commanded to do anything sinful by the king, you, you may eschew that command. In fact, you must eschew that command, shun it, don't follow it. Yet you must do so without outright over resistance or rebellion. You can't use, if the king commands you to bow down to an idol, that doesn't give you license to then launch a rebellion against the king. Only God can hold wicked kings accountable. And how does God hold wicked kings accountable? Well, God can punish that king or remove that king in whatever manner he sees fit. But the king is to be accountable to no man. The king is to be accountable to no earthly authority, including parliament. The king is not accountable to parliament. That's an earthly authority. Accountable to God alone. And again, you know, uh, James says, beware, O king. Uh, the fact that you're accountable to God alone should not give you, you know, re relax, give you relief if you're a wicked king. In uh, the 110th chapter of the book of Psalms, it says that the Lord will, quote, shatter kings on the day of his wrath. The Lord will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Those wicked kings will be shattered by the Lord, but by God, not by, not by, not by man, not by parliament, but by God alone. And this is good, James says, because even a wicked king, it's better to have a wicked king than to have civil war and anarchy and rebellion. Because even a, even government under a wicked king still has some good aspects about it. Look at this quote from the True Law of Free Monarchies. Quote, it is certain that a king can never be so monstrously vicious, but he will generally favor justice. Even a wicked king, James says, generally favors justice. You look at some of those old Roman emperors like Nero, okay, wicked, wicked emperor. Yet there was still some, quite a bit of justice across the empire as a whole, notwithstanding that wicked emperor. He will generally favor justice, even at Wicked King, and maintain some order. You, you still have some order, even with the Wicked King, except in the particulars wherein his inordinate lust and passions carry him away. Where, by the contrary, no king being, nothing is unlawful to none. You take away the king, you take away government, and it's just, everything's up for grabs, okay? A man does what is right in his own eyes. A war of all against all, to quote Hobbes. See some of the overlap here between Hobbes and divine right of kings. More on that in a moment. And so, James says, the old opinion of the philosophers proves true. That better it is to live in a commonwealth where nothing is lawful than where all things are lawful to all men. Quite a quote quotation there. Better it is to live in a commonwealth where nothing is lawful. Better it is to live in a tyranny. Better it is to live under a wicked government than to live in a state of anarchy where all things are lawful to all men. Hobbes would be in agreement with that. Staunch agreement with that, actually. God has a purpose for wicked kings, James says. A wicked king is sent by God for a curse to his people and a plague for their sins. But that it is lawful to, to them, that is the people, to shake off that curse at their own hand, which God hath laid on them, that I deny. If you have a wicked king, maybe you should think about why you have a wicked king. Maybe there's a reason, a divine, divinely ordained reason that you have a wicked king. It is certain then, that patience, earnest prayers to God, and amendment of their lives are the only lawful means to move God to relieve them of that heavy curse. You are not to start rebellion. What you should do is amend your life and be patient and make an appeal to God. And James is confident that if the people do, do such, God will re recognize that and reward that either by changing the heart of the wicked king or by removing the king through some other means. But you are not to do that yourself. It is not up to you to make that judgment. God is doubtless the only judge, James said. 
Shall it lie in the hands of a headless multitude when they please to weary off subjection, to cast off the yoke of government that God hath set upon them, to judge and punish him that is a ruler by whom they should be judged and punished? A headless multitude. Do you want the headless multitude to make that judgment on whether or not a king should be cast off or the government should be cast off? You're going to have disorder. You're going to have anarchy. You're going to have chaos. Better to suffer through the problems of a wicked king than to have that is James's argument. And here again, we see, we see a lot of overlap with Hobbes. Now there's some stark differentiation between divine right of kings and Hobbes's Leviathan. <clears throat> Hobbes, in effect, secularizes this doctrine of divine right of kings. He gives it a, a secular overtone. He, you could say, updates it for the modern era. First, he broadens the theory to include any sovereign, any central authority, not just kings, maybe a king, but could be an, an assembly. Uh, James would disagree with that. James would say, no, it must be a king. Monarchy is the really the only true sovereign. Hobbes leaves a door open for an assembly to be the sovereign. That's one difference. Difference number two, Hobbes replaces God with the social contract. So the so what is the source of the sovereign's authority? James would say it's God. Hobbes would say social contract. Though those are the two great differences. Hobbes broadens it out to any sovereign, including an assembly, possibly. Could be a king, but perhaps an assembly. And then he says the source of that authority is social contract. Outside of that, more similarities and differences. And for both Hobbes and James, the sovereign must be absolute. The sovereign is absolute. And if you don't have an absolute sovereign, discord, chaos, civil war result. And then for both men, the sovereign may not and must not be resisted. Must not be resisted. Can't have it. Or else, again, you, you'll uh, revert back to that state of nature, back to that war of all against all. King James <clears throat> had a very tense relationship with Parliament, as you can probably imagine. Oh, the House of Commons was uh, growing more and more restless under James's reign. Again, never an outright open conflict, but certainly clashes, uh, particularly over the issue of taxation. James had a very expensive and extravagant court, far more than his predecessors, and the commons was reluctant to just grant him any taxes that he desired. And so James actually dissolved Parliament in 1614 and then didn't call a Parliament for six and a half years. Between 1614 and the beginning of 1621, there was no Parliament in session. Six and a half years, James ruled without Parliament, successfully. In fact, he would have rather not dealt with them at all. This was a speech that he gave to the Spanish ambassador in 1614, the same year that he dissolved Parliament and then proceeded to rule alone for six and a half years. He said this, quote, The House of Commons is a body without a head. The members give their opinions in a disorderly manner. At their meetings, nothing is heard but cries, shouts, and confusion. I'm surprised that my ancestors should ever have permitted such an institution to come into existence. I am obliged to put up with what I cannot get rid of. <laughs> wow. That's a as quite a quite a quote there. If it were up to me, I'd just not have them at all. I just get rid of the whole institution of parliament. I mean, he doesn't. He he does not view view parliament as a necessary institution. That's for sure. He'd rather get rid of it. But he's he he knows he has those limitations. Again, remember the English monarchy during this time, while very powerful by today's standard for monarchy, nonetheless was more restricted and constrained than the monarch in Spain, for example. <clears throat> 
or France. Parlance is just a form of disorderliness, of ambitious men seeking their own personal interest. That's how James, how James views it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, to return to our author, Thomas Hobbes, as a young man during the reign of James I, Hobbes attended the University of Oxford and at Oxford he studied Aristotelian logic, studied mathematics and astronomy, Renaissance humanism, Calvinist theology, and in the 1610s, 1620s, Hobbes became a secretary and private tutor. Through this early part of his career, he took a deep interest, especially in mathematics, but also in some classical literature. All right, James dies in 1625, and his son, Charles, becomes king. And Charles, like his father, very much embraced the doctrine of divine right of kings. <clears throat> Charles summoned parliaments in 1625 and 1626 so that they would grant him new taxes to finance to what were very unpopular wars with Spain and France. Parliament refused to grant him those taxes unless he made certain concessions. Charles didn't want to make those concessions and so he dissolved Parliament and in 1627 attempted to sidestep Parliament by collecting revenue without any parliamentary act. He used the army to collect that revenue, imprisoned anybody who refused to pay, imprisoned them without trial, and then a few months later in 1628 deployed martial law and forced private citizens to house and feed soldiers on demand. Well, later in 1628, his finances were in such a, a mess that he was compelled, again, that, that constraint on the monarchy in England, he was compelled, much against his wishes, to summon a new parliament, and that parliament immediately went to work drafting a petition, came out of the commons, but then, importantly, it was approved by the House of Lords, quite surprisingly, in which both chambers of parliament outlined certain liberties that the king must not violate, could not violate, by law. And those liberties included uh, a habeas corpus. The king could not imprison somebody without cause or without trial. They condemned martial law. The petition condemned uh, non-parliamentary taxation. You've got to consult, you have to have the authorization of parliament to enact new taxes. You can't quarter soldiers. The billeting of soldiers. And this prohibited certain fundamental rights in England. <clears throat> of course, our Third Amendment in uh, the Bill of Rights in the United States prohibits the quartering of soldiers. Well, because it was passed by both chambers of Parliament, Charles had no choice but to accept the petition. But then a few months later, the war with France ended. The war with Spain had already ended by that point. And so Charles didn't really need any new taxes. He was free to dissolve Parliament. He did so in 1629. And then he proceeded to rule England without a single session of Parliament for 11 years. 11 years, no Parliament in session. This is called the personal rule of Charles I. Critics later described it as the 11 years tyranny, the 11 years tyranny. Throughout this period, Charles claimed that the petition of right was not a legal document. It wasn't binding on him or anything. And so he proceeded to violate the very liberties that were outlined in that document. Charles utilized the Star Chamber, which was a secret prerogative court that did not abide by due process, wasn't subject to common law, and his very unpopular Archbishop William Laud used the Star Chamber to persecute leading Puritans who objected to the uh, religious uniformity of that Laud attempted to impose on all the churches 
in England. Many of these Puritans were hauled before the Star Chamber, again, uh, w without due process. Some of them had their ears cropped, others were branded in the cheek. And for this reason, in the 1630s, thousands and thousands of Puritans fled England for Holland, but especially for New, uh, New England, across the Atlantic in America, especially Massachusetts. So all, thousands of, uh, of people fleeing religious persecution in England. And so through the 1630s, no parliament, Charles's court was increasingly uh, isolated, alienated from the rest of the country. This uh, portrait here, the three portraits of Charles was uh, uh, drawn up in 16, around 1636 or so. I always think he looks like John Lennon. You see, see the resemblance a little bit? I, I can see it, I can see it. Um, these are portraits of Charles in the late 1630s. And so the tensions come into a boiling point by the end of the 1630s. Meanwhile, returning back to Hobbes, um, Thomas Hobbes in the late 1620s and 1630s began thinking a whole lot more about history, philosophy, statecraft. This is the earliest portrait, I believe, that we have of Hobbes. This is Hobbes in 1646. In 1628, Hobbes translated for the first time Thucydides' famous work, History of the Peloponnesian War, into English. And there it is. This was the first edition, the front piece to the first edition. There's the second edition, Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes greatly admired Thucydides. He thought Thucydides was one of the greatest thinkers of the ancient world. And it really shows. Again, uh, you should watch our series on Thucydides that I did last year. And Thucydides and Thomas Hobbes share a whole lot in common with regard to their view of human nature. And also their embrace of a... a a charismatic head of state. For Thucydides, it was Pericles. And I imagine that Thomas Hobbes, as he translated this work, also had a deep admiration for Pericles. Thomas moved to Paris temporarily in the 1630s, lived in Paris for much of the 1630s. This is a, a bird's eye view of Paris around the year 1630. And in Paris, he worked as a tutor, mostly a mathematics tutor. And again, he continued to develop his philosophical interests during this period. There's Paris in the 17th century. Hobbes returned to England in 1636, and he returned to an England, to, and especially London, that was increasingly discontented with the political situation. By this point, the king had ruled alone for many years. Hobbes sided firmly with the king. In 1640, he authored a, a short treatise called The Elements of Law, in which he defended royal authority, ardently defended royal authority, including on matters of taxation. And so Hobbes, by 1640, had been, become associated with the proponents of absolute monarchy so that when the English Civil War broke out Hobbes had a high tail it out of England or actually just prior to the war breaking out Hobbes left England out of fear that Parliament might arrest him for sedition he was that closely associated with the Royalists now by 1640 Charles was in a world of trouble he was facing a, rebe a rebellion from Scottish Presbyterians needed to raise tax revenue beyond what he was able to do independently. And in April, 1640, he finally called another parliament. And woo, this parliament has a few things to say. Okay, so we'll go ahead and stop there next time. You're not gonna wanna miss part three, all right? <laughs> uh, next time we'll take a look at the 1640s and 1650s and, and where Hobbes fit into all of this. You might be surprised, Hobbes in 1640s, it's considered an ardent royalist, but by 1651, Hobbes makes peace with the revolutionary 
English state reconciles with that revolutionary state. I think you'll see why uh, in part three. See you then.